Greetings, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. We are in Parshat Amor in the book of Leviticus. It begins with chapter 21. We'll read through the English translation of our portion. I'll share with you a bit of focused study on the portion, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation. If you'd like to go ahead at this point and unmute, together we can recite our blessing, giving thanks for the opportunity of this moment. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. Uh, Book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 21, verse 1. I'll read a few verses, and then I'll offer everyone an opportunity to read some verses as well. Adonai said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for any dead person among his kin, except for the relatives that are closest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. Also for a virgin sister, close to him because she has not married. For her he may defile himself. But he shall not defile himself as a kinsman by marriage, and so profane himself. Anna, would you like to read a little bit at verse 5? Thanks. They shall not shave, smooth any part of their heads, or cut the side growth of their beards, or make gashes in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer Adonai's offerings by fire, the food of their God, and so must be holy. Thank you. Richard, would you like to read at verse 7? Thank you. Uh, they shall not marry a woman degraded by harlotry. Nor shall they marry one divorced from her husband. They are holy to their God, and you must treat them as holy, since they offer the food of your God. They shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. When the daughter of a priest degrades herself through harlotry, it is her father whom she degrades. She shall be put to the fire. Thank you, Richard. And Sherry, would you like to read a little bit at verse 10? For the priest who is exalted above his fellows, on whose head the anointing oil has been poured, and who has been ordained to wear the vestments, shall not bear his head or rend his vestments. He shall not go in where there is any dead body. He shall not defile himself, even for his father or mother. He shall not go outside the sanctuary and profane the sanctuary of his God, for upon him is the distinction of the anointing oil of his God. Mine is the Lord's. He may marry only a woman who is a virgin, a widow or divorced woman, or one who is degraded by holotry. He shall not marry. Only a virgin of his own kin may he take to his wife, that, they may, that he may not profane his offspring among his kin, for I, the Lord, has sanctified him. Thank you. Steve, do you want to read a little bit? No, I can't okay. read it because I, I disagree with all of that. And the women, the women are so terrible that they're the ones that created the society that made women into harlots. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> and Tony, would you like to re read a little bit, beginning okay. at verse 16? The Lord spoke further to Moses. Speak to Aaron and say, no man of your offspring throughout the ages who has a defect shall be qualified to offer the food of his God. No one at all who has a defect shall be qualified. No man who is blind or lame or has a limb too short or too long. No man who has a broken leg or a broken arm, or who is a hunchback or a dwarf, or who has a growth in his eye, or, has, or who has a boil scar, or scurvy, or crushed testes. No man among the offspring of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall be qualified to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. Having a defect, he shall not be qualified to offer the food of his God. He may eat of the food of his God, of the most holy, as well as of the holy. But he shall not enter behind the curtain or come near the altar, for he has a defect. 
He shall not profane these places sacred to me, for I, the Lord, have sanctified them. One more verse. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. Get the page. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, Moses spoke to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> and Mark, would you like to read at the very start of ch chapter 22 for a little bit? Thank you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Instruct Aaron and his sons to be scrupulous about the sacred donations that the Israelite people consecrate to me, lest they profane my holy name. Mine, the Lord's, say to them, Throughout the ages, if any man among your offspring, while in a state of uncleanness, partakes of any sacred donation that the Israelite people may concentrate to the Lord, that person shall be cut off from me from before me. I am Adonai. No man of Aaron's offspring who has an eruption or a discharge shall eat of the sacred donations until he is clean. If one touches anything made unclean by a corpse, or if a man has an emission of semen, or if a man touches any swarming thing by which he is made unclean, or any human being by whom he is made unclean, whatever his uncleanliness, the person who touches such shall be unclean until evening, and shall not eat of the sacred donations unless he has washed his body in water. As soon as the sun sets, he shall be clean, and afterward, he may eat of the sacred donations, for they are his food. He shall not eat anything that died or was torn by beasts, thereby becoming unclean. I am Adonai. They shall keep my charge, lest they incur guilt thereby and die for it, having committed prof profanation. I, Adonai, consecrate them. Thank you, Mark. And Dave, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 10? No lay person shall eat the sacred donations. No bound or hired laborer of a priest shall eat of the sacred donations. But a person who is a priest's property by purchase may eat them, and those who are born into his household may eat of his food. If a priest's daughter becomes a layman's wife, she may not eat of the sacred gifts. But if the priest's daughter is widowed or divorced and without offspring, and is back in her father's house as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food. No lay person may eat of it. But if any such party eats of a sacred donation unwittingly, the priest shall be paid for the sacred donation, adding one-fifth its value. But the priests must not allow the Israelites to profane the sacred donation that they set aside for Adonai, or to incur guilt requiring a penalty payment by eating such sacred donations, for it is I, Adonai, who make them sacred. Thank Adonai. you, so, Thank you, Dave. Let me invite uh, Michael. Would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse seventeen? Uh, yeah, sure. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to the Israelites, and you'll say to them." Every man of the house of Israel and of the sojourner in Israel who brings forward his offering for any of their votive offerings or their free will offerings that they bring forward uh, to the Lord as burnt offerings to be acceptable for you, it shall be an unblemished male from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not bring forward, for it will not be acceptable for you. And should a man bring forward a communion, uh, sacrifice, a communion sacrifice to the Lord to set aside as a votive offerings or free will offering from the cattle or from the flock, it shall be unblemished to be acceptable. No defect shall there be in it. Anything blind or broken or lacerated or with a wen or scab or skin flake, these you shall not bring forward to the Lord. And no fire offering from them shall you put in the altar to the Lord. And a bull or sheep with a stretched or, or, or crimped limb, you may make a freewill offering, but it shall not be acceptable as a votive offering. And anything with crushed or smashed or torn off or cut off uh, testes, 
you shall not bring forward to the Lord, and in your land you shall not do it. And from the, from, from the hand of a foreigner you shall not bring forward uh, your God bread from any of these. Their deformity is in them. A, de a defect is in them. They shall not be acceptable for you. Thank you so much, Michael. And Robert, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 26? Yes, thank you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, then it shall be seven days under the dam, and from the eighth day and thenceforth it shall be accepted for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And whether it be cow or oo, will not kill it and her young both in one day. Quiet, Bernie. And when you will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer it at your own will. On the same day it shall be eaten up. You shall leave none of it until the morrow. I am the Lord. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord, which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Thank you, Robert. And Robin, would you like to read at the very start of chapter 23? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, These are my fixed times, the fixed times of Adonai, which you shall proclaim as sacred occasions. On six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest, a sacred occasion. You shall do no work. It shall be a Sabbath of Adonai throughout your settlements. These are the set times of Adonai, the sacred occasions, which you shall celebrate each at its appointed time. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, there shall be a Passover offering to Adonai. And on the 15th day of that month, Adonai's <laughs> feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day, you shall celebrate a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupations. Seven days, you shall make offerings by fire to Adonai. The seventh day shall be a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupations. Thank you, Robert. And uh, Jim, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse nine? Thank you, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land that I am giving to you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. He shall elevate the sheep before Adonai for acceptance in your behalf. The priest shall elevate it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day that you elevate the sheaf, you shall offer as a burnt offering to Adonai, a lamb of the first year without blemish. The meal offering with it shall be two tenths of a measure of choice flour and oil mixed in, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Adonai, and the libation with it shall be of wine, a quarter of a hen. Until that very day, until you have brought the offering of your God, you shall eat no bread or parched grain, or fresh ears. It is a law for all time throughout the ages in all your settlements. Thank you so much, Jim. And Justin, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 15? <clears throat> you shall count for yourselves from the morrow of the rest day from the day you bring the Omer as a wave offering, seven weeks, they shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh week, namely the 50th day, on which you shall bring a new meal offering to the Lord. From your dwelling places, you shall bring bread, set aside two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah so that they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked, leavened, the first offering to the Lord. 
and associated with the bread, you shall bring seven unblemished lambs in their first year, one young bull and two rams. These shall be burnt offering to the Lord, along with their meal offering and libations, a fire offering with a spirit of satisfaction to the Lord. And you shall offer up one he goat as a sin offering and two lambs in their first year as a peace mm -hmm. offering. <coughs> and the Kohen shall wave them in conjunction with the first offering uh, bread as a waving before the Lord along with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord and belong to the Kohen. And you shall designate on this very day a holy occasion it shall be for you. You shall not perform any work of labor. This is an eternal statute in all your dwelling places throughout Thank your you. generations. Thank you so much, Justin. And uh, uh, Tom and uh, Jackie, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse 22? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I, Adonai, am your God. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people thus. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe complete rest, a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. You shall not work at your occupations and you shall bring an offering by fire Adonai. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Mark the tenth day of the seventh month of the Day of Atonement. It shall be a sacred occasion for you. You shall practice self-denial, and you shall bring an offering <coughs> by fire to Adonai. You shall do no work throughout that day. For it is a Day of Atonement on which uh, expiation is made on your behalf before your God Adonai. Indeed, any person who does not practice self-denial throughout the day shall be cut off from his kin. And whoever does any work throughout the day, I will cause that person to perish among uh, uh, the people. Do not work, whatever. It is the law for all time throughout the ages of all your settlements. It shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you shall practice self-denial. On the ninth day of the month, of, at evening from evening, uh, to evening. You shall observe this your Sabbath. Thank you both so much. And Margo, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse 33? Yes. The, thank you. I, I was eating dinner <laughs> earlier. No. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, say to the Israelite people, on the 15th day of this seventh month, there shall be a feast of booths to the Lord, uh, to the Lord, seven, uh, to the Lord, to last seven days. The first day shall be a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupations. Seven days you shall bring offerings by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall observe the sacred occasion and bring an offering by fire to the Lord. It is a solemn gathering. You shall not work at your occupations. Should I go on? Sure. Why don't you read uh, all the way through verse 38? Oh, ha happily. Um, those are the set times of the Lord that you shall celebrate as sacred occasions, bringing offerings by fire to the Lord, burnt offerings, meal offerings, sacrifices, and libations on each day, what is proper to it. Uh, apart from the Sabbaths of the Lord and, and apart from your gifts, and from your votive offerings and from your free will offerings that you give to the Lord. Thank you so much, Margaret. And Jay, would you like to read uh, beginning at verse 39? Sure. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Mark, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the yield of your land, you shall observe the festival of the Lord to last seven days, a complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day. 
On the first day, you shall take the product of the Hadar trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before Adonai your God seven days. You shall observe it as the festival of Adonai for seven days in the year. You shall observe it in the seventh month as a law for all time. Throughout the ages, you shall live in booths seven days. All citizens in Israel shall live in booths. In order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am Adonai your God. So Moses declared to the Israelites the set times of Adonai. Thank you, Jeff. And Catherine, would you like to read a little bit at the very start of chapter 24? Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. The and Adonai spoke to Moses saying, command the Israelite people to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling lamps regularly. Aaron shall set them up in the tent of meeting outside the curtain of the pact to burn from the evening to morning before the Adonai regularly. It is a law for the ages. He shall set up lamps on the pure lampstand before the Lord to burn regularly. Shall I go on? Yes, please. You shall take choice flour and bake of it 12 loaves, two tenths of a measure for each loaf. Place them in the pure, on the pure table before Adonai in two rows, six to a row. With each row, you shall place pure frankincense which is to be a token offering for the bread as an offering to fire to Adonai. He shall arrange them before Adonai regularly every Sabbath day. It is a commitment for all time on the part of the Israelites. They shall belong to Aaron and his sons who shall eat them in the sacred precinct for they are his as most holy things from Adonai, offerings by fire are due for all time. Thank you so much, Catherine. We're on verse 10 now. There came out among the Israelites, one whose mother was an Israelite and whose father was Egyptian. And a fight broke out in the camp between the half Israelite and a certain Israelite. The son of the Israelite woman pronounced the name in blasphemy and he was brought to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shilamit, daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Don. And he was placed in custody until the decision of Adonai should be made clear to them. And Adonai spoke to Moses saying, take the blasphemer outside the camp and let all who are within hearing lay their hands upon his head and let the whole community stone him. And to the Israelite people speak thus, Anyone who blasphemes his God shall bear his guilt. If he also pronounces the name, I don't know, he shall be put to death. The whole community shall stone him, stranger or citizen. If he has thus pronounced the name, he shall be put to death. If anyone kills any human being, he shall be put to death. One who kills a beast shall make restitution for it, life for life. If anyone maims his fellow, as he has done so, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The injury he inflicted on another shall be inflicted on him. One who kills a beast shall make restitution for it. But one who kills a human being shall be put to death. You shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike. For I, Adonai, am your God. Moses spoke thus to the Israelites, and they took the blasphemer outside the camp and pelted him with stones. The Israelites did as Adonai had commanded Moses. That's our Torah portion for this week. I'd like to share with you a little bit of focus study, and, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation where everyone has an opportunity to share uh, their reflections and responses to this week's Torah portion. If you have a copy of this week's study sheet, I invite you to take it out at this point. And uh, at the very top is a painting by 
the American abstract expressionist painter Jackson Pollock. We'll get into some uh, more detailed discussion about the painting itself towards the end of our study time. But for right now, I'd like you just to look at this painting. I'd like you to ponder the image and then also ponder the text that we've just read. And perhaps consider these questions. Does what I see on the canvas here have any coherent sense for me? And then ponder this perhaps. Does what I read in the book of Leviticus have any coherent sense for me? We're gonna be carrying with us both uh, the impact of this painting, the impact of our text as we move through our study session together. I've entitled this study session, Convergence Where Lovers Meet. You'll note that the painting by Jackson Paul is called Convergence and we'll explore a little bit more uh, what, what that might mean. Uh, our Parsha, uh, Parshat Amor, uh, spends quite a bit of time discussing the festivals. Uh, and there are, within Torah, there are five significant uh, passages that describe uh, the festivals. Uh, two, of, two of those five appear in the book of Exodus, and they're very brief uh, about the festivals, uh, basically denoting when they are to be observed. Uh, a third portion uh, passage describing the festivals appears in the book of Numbers. And in that passage, uh, it focuses primarily on the special sacrifices and offerings that are, be are to be made uh, during these festivals. And one passage about festivals appears in the book of Deuteronomy. And the focus there in the book of Deuteronomy on, on the festivals has more to do with the nature of the social inclusion aspect of the festivals. Uh, everyone is to participate uh, and, and to uh, come uh, to the uh, city where these uh, festivals will be held, which later becomes Jerusalem, and everyone's to participate in some kind of way. So it, it focuses on the extent to which everyone is encouraged and, and obligated to participate in observing these uh, festivals. Uh, what's interesting, is that uh, in Deuteronomy, there's um, no focus, uh, rather there's no mention of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, unlike what we've just read here. And then the fifth uh, passage that mentions the festivals is the one that we just read here in the book of Leviticus. And unlike the passages in Exodus and Deuteronomy, it includes both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and what makes it unique among all of these passages is that in addition to all of the, the three festivals, plus Rosh Hashanah, plus Yom Kippur, it also includes in the list Shabbat. And the inclusion of Shabbat in the, in the listings of these uh, appointed times of, of the year, these um, Moadei uh, causes a lot of provocation among the commentators. Uh, significantly, here we have uh, Rashi in number two, who asks the question, why is the subject of Shabbat next to that of the festivals? And he asks that because he's, he's pointing out these are two very distinct uh, categories of uh, celebrations or, or commemorations. Uh, the festivals are called Moadei, appointed times, because in order to observe them, it required uh, action by the leaders of the community uh, who were known as the Beit Din, the, the judges. They were the ones who had to declare, ah, there's a new moon. We know now when the, uh, the observation, uh, the commemoration of these festivals will, will take place. 
So it required an active decision by the human community to, to denote the date upon which these uh, festivals will be observed. That's completely different from Shabbat. Shabbat requires no human uh, intervention in, in order to be observed. They just happen. They are, according to the, the religious point of view, they're a gift from God. And they just flow in, in the course of time. They, they, are, they require no decision to demark when they might occur. So Rashi is now confused. Why are we conflating uh, a human initiated uh, demarcation of time and a divine demarcated sense, sense of time? Rashi has an answer. Uh, his answer is that, well, here in the book of Leviticus, they've been brought together as a way to remind everyone how sacred the festivals are. In other words, they are as important as Shabbat and therefore everyone should observe them. But there are other answers to this provocation that's presented by the text by conflating or con conjoining these two different categories of Moadei, the appointed times, and Shabbat, which occurs naturally, if you will. <clears throat> and so we have here one of the great scholars, the Vilna Gaon, who says this. These words apply not to the days of the week, uh, but to the days of the year. And he's looking now at one of the verses that we just read, chapter 23, verse three. Six days shall you work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Sabbaths. And the Vilna Gaon says, when it's talking about six days of working and the seventh day of not working, it's not really talking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so forth. It's talking about something else. He goes on to say, these words apply not to the days of the week, but to the days of the year. The, it refers to the first and seventh day of Pesach. Did you hear some of that, that service there? The day of Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the first day of Sukkot, and Shmini Atzeret. So if you look at those as he's listed them, uh, the first day of Pesach, he would say is number one. The seventh day of Pesach is day number two. Uh, the day of Shavuot is number three. Rosh Hashanah, number four. We'll get back to Yom Kippur. The first day of Sukkot is number five. Shmini Atzeret is number six. And Yom Kippur, he would say, is number seven. Why does he come to that conclusion? Ah, because we also read in our portion, Yom Kippur is a Sabbath of Sabbaths, a Shabbat Shabbaton. Because Yom Kippur is referred to this way as Shabbat Shabbaton, it allows him to now identify Shabbat and Yom Kippur as if as just as Shabbat is the seventh day of the week, Yom Kippur, in effect, is the seventh day of the year. It has the, the same sanctity, if you will, and has a higher level of sanctity than the other uh, six days of the year, namely the first and seventh day of Pesach, the day of Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Sukkot, and the day of Shemini Atzeret. And he uh, goes on to identify other ways in which there's this similarity. He says, uh, Torah uh, has actually two different expressions for the prohibition of work on the festivals and on the seventh day. Forbidden on festivals is Malecha Avoda, which is, can be translated as burdensome work. What's forbidden on Shabbat and Yom Kippur is melacha, any work. So once again, there is this way in which Vilna Gaon is now identifying Shabbat and Yom Kippur because of what's prohibited on that day, which is distinct from what's prohibited in terms of 
labor or work uh, on the festivals. One of the fascinating things that uh, Vilnaga owns now uh, categorization uh, reveals is that uh, in a sense, there's a pattern of sixes and sevens that he's now uh, identifying. That there's something of sixes that has a slightly lesser degree of holiness. And then there's something that is seven that has a elevated degree of holiness. And it has to do with, uh, and that applies to the days of the week. All the days of the week are uh, have a degree of sanctity, but the seventh day of the week, Shabbat, has a higher degree of sanctity. Uh, and then there are six uh, days of observation, commemoration during the course of the year, which have a degree of sanctity. But the seventh one, Yom Kippur, uh, has an elevated degree of sanctity. And the same is true over numbers of years. Years one through six have a degree of sanctity. But when we get to the seventh year, Shemitah has an elevated degree of sanctity. And what's also fascinating is about this chapter 23 in the book of Leviticus, which describes these festivals and associates Shabbat and Yom Kippur, according to Vilna Gaon. If you were to open up a Torah scroll, you would see that what we have just read as chapter 23 consists of seven paragraphs. So this pattern that, we're, that we've just identified of sixes and sevens uh, in a week, uh, over the course of a year, over a course of number of years, that pattern which is, which is described at uh, a rather grand level and then a, a more narrow level and then at a more granular level of the week itself, uh, this is what can be called uh, a fractal. That is when we're, we're going to look at the notion of what is a fractal and what that might be teaching us. So if you if you have uh, your your study sheet, I invite you to turn it over. So this this notion of a fractal, this pattern, uh, which is one that's repeated at different levels of, of magnitude. Um, and here's a, a, a definition I've provided at the very top. A fractal is a form of geometric repetition in which smaller and smaller copies of a pattern are successively nested inside each other so that the same intricate shapes appear no matter how much you zoom in to the whole. So uh, this notion of, uh, of a fractal, uh, this pattern that we're seeing is something that was really uh, developed into um, a, a mathematical model, fract uh, fractal geometry um, by a man named Benoit uh, ben uh, Mandelbrot. And Benoit Mandelbrot was a, was a fascinating genius. He was born into a, a Polish family. I believe it was 1924 is when he was born. Uh, and then in, uh, in Warsaw, his family uh, fled uh, Warsaw. Uh, his father, I believe, was also a, a, a brilliant um, mathematician. He had an uncle who was a brilliant mathematician. Um, and they fled Warsaw to go to France. Uh, and they lived in, uh, in relative uh, safety within uh, what was then unoccupied portions of France. Uh, and then eventually he uh, uh, came to the United States after the Second World War. He was uh, actually quite amazed that he and his family were able to survive the, uh, the, the onslaught of the war and of uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, he developed this, this notion of looking at what seems to be, um, pat he, what he found was order within patterns that, of, that seem unknowingly complicated. And it became described as 
the art of roughness, things, shapes, uh, and surfaces that appear to have very rough characteristics to them, both in nature as well as in, uh, in math, he was able to identify that even within those, one could find a repeating pattern that would bring, in a sense, order out of this apparent uh, uh, chaos. So he was able to describe irregular shapes that exhibit uh, self-similarity. That, that is, they, they look the same uh, under uh, varying uh, layers uh, of dimensionality. Um, he, he wrote about them, bottomless wonders spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. And fractal, he wrote, is a way of seeing infinity. So I'd like you to hold this thought about fractals about repeating patterns within what seems to be pure chaos uh, and how, according to Mandelbrot, uh, the fractal is a way of ultimately seeing something of infinity within them. So if you hold on to that thought about fractals, we're gonna go return to our text and we're gonna look at festivals. So, <clears throat> The list of festivals, as we've just encountered it in, in the book of Leviticus, emphasizes not the uh, sacrificial dimension, which is what's described in the book of Numbers, or the social dimension about observing them together as a community, which is how they are described in the book of Deuteronomy. I wanna suggest that what's happening here in the book of Leviticus, that as they describe the festivals, is that it's emphasizing the spiritual dimension of these festivals, which has to do with encounter, closeness, and attachment. So the word moed, which means uh, appointed, uh, we encounter very particularly within the book of Leviticus because it's focusing on what's called the ochel moed which we know as the, the sanctuary in the wilderness. And really what it means is uh, ochel, the tent moed of meeting. And so what's the way the ochel moed is being described as this is the place, this is the, the, this is the function of drawing the community and God closer together through a variety of rituals. So the Moadim, as they're being described in our chapter 23, are times when we and God meet. That's the way the festivals are being described here in chapter 23 in the book of Leviticus. And this notion about Moed as an opportunity, as a environment within which humanity and God draw closer together uh, appears in a song that is traditionally sung on Shabbat, Yedi Nefesh, uh, which is translated as, Hari beloved, for the appointed time has come. Kiva Moed, the appointed time has come. This moment of Shabbat, this Yedi Nefesh, uh, Kiva Moed, this is a heightened time of overcoming barriers of dimensions and separations and of achieving heightened sense of attachment, unity, wholeness, shalom, peace. Uh, the great uh, Jewish poet who lived in Spain, Yehuda Halavi, uh, wrote a lot of poems having to do with nature's the nature of both separation and of coming together. He wrote a beautiful poem uh, in Spain, looking out across the Mediterranean, longing to be in the, the land of Israel. He said, it would be enough for me just to roll around in the dust of, of where the, the temple had once stood, just to be a have, a, have that sense of attachment to this place of holiness. 
And he applied this same sense of longing, yearning, and desire for connection and attachment in a poem that is ostensibly about one's relationship, his relationship with God, but it could also be described as his, uh, one's relationship with another human being. Here's a verse from his poem, Where Shall I Find You? I have sought your nearness. With all my heart have I called you. And going out to meet you, I found you going out toward me. And here's the way the great Sufi poet Rumi describes this same feeling. The minute I heard my first love story, I started looking for you, not knowing how blind that was. Lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. Mm -hmm. Now, if we could turn back to our painting. I want to suggest this uh, about Jackson Pollock and tie it into uh, our work that we've been doing in Torah. Uh, Jackson Pollock, I believe he was born in um, 1924 about, um, uh, in Cody, Wyoming. Really, Cody, Wyoming? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, he becomes one of the great uh, abstract expressionists in, in, the, in the world. Um, and he develops a form of painting uh, that is sometimes called action painting, because what he would do is he would take the canvas and he'd lay the canvas down on the ground and then he would move around the canvas and he would engage in a, in a form of dance, if you will. And he would uh, dance around, move around the canvas and he would sometimes drip uh, paint onto a canvas. Sometimes he would take a brush and he would fling it onto the canvas. He would pour paint on, onto the canvas. And what he was really doing that the, the art of Jackson Pollock really is not what you see on the canvas. The art is what he was doing. And the, what's on the canvas, if you will, is a record of the art. It's not the art itself. And so that's sometimes why it's called action painting because what was really the work of art was his, his activity. That was the art. The, the painting itself is trying to capture the experience uh, of the art that he was doing. I just want to perhaps allow us to consider that maybe that's what Torah is as well. That sometimes we get so focused on the words on the page before us that we don't think uh, enough about what preceded the words on the page. And that maybe that is really what's sacred and holy. That's the sacred art, what preceded the words being on the page. <clears throat> In fact, now that I think about uh, <clears throat> Benot Mandelbrot said something similar about fractals. He said, focus not on what you see before you, think more about what produced what you see before you. And uh, what's fascinating about Jackson Pollock's work is that uh, there has been in recent years uh, uh, several at uh, attempts at doing some fractal analysis of his paintings. And they've, uh, some scientists have, have used uh, computer pa pattern analysis techniques in order to look within the canvas to see what patterns they might discover. And uh, there have been a number of studies that have revealed what we would call fractals, these repeating patterns at different dimensionalities within, within the work itself. Now, whether or not Jackson Pollock was intentionally seeking to do that, yeah. <laughs> or whether they appeared because of what he was doing before the paint hit the canvas 
is really a, a profoundly interesting question because uh, Jackson Pollock was uh, a, a haunted person. Uh, he was uh, often deeply depressed. Uh, he, was, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he would uh, explode in, sometimes in, in, in furious outbursts. And he was, uh, he was engaged uh, particularly in Jungian uh, psychoanalysis. And so it, he was, it may well be that he was in search of something that would bring him a greater sense of wholeness. And it may be that these different uh, practices that he was engaged in, particularly through Jungian analysis, perhaps out of those moments, he was able to participate in some kind of exercise that whether he intentionally, consciously or unconsciously was able to, if not in his own life, at least onto the canvas that recorded a moment in his life, was able to achieve some degree of, of pattern and harmony beneath uh, the chaos that we, that we sometimes see. So um, I, this notion of, of um, what Jackson Pollock has done here, He's created a work of art that he calls Convergence. And again, I don't know whether he called it Convergence because he feels he accomplished that. And this was uh, an, a statement of what he'd been able to accomplish or whether it was something more aspirational that that's what he was seeking was some kind of Convergence. What we uncovered in our Torah portion is a message that's ostensibly directed to the Levites. But as we've discussed throughout the book of our study of the book of Leviticus, there's also perhaps a subtle, perhaps unconscious, perhaps below the surface of the text uh, message to all of us uh, about how we can engage in a practice that will bring us uh, outside of ourselves, towards one another, and perhaps towards the source of it all, which will bring us uh, a sense of convergence. And with that, uh, I would love to open it up and hear what you saw, what you felt, how you reacted to our Torah portion. Margo. Well, I feel a little bit silly because I, <laughs> excuse me, our discussions are always esoteric, but I always go back to the secular. It's very disturbing to me that you have to be perfect in body and in form to approach the Lord. And because we all know you can be perfect in body and imperfect in soul. And, I, and it's upsetting to me that the rabbis haven't discussed this because it's very bob, it's very troublesome to me in today's times to discard the lame. So let me just ask you right away. I was with you until you said it troubles me that the rabbis haven't discussed this. Yeah, have what, they? What makes you think they haven't discussed this? Yeah, well, that's actually I would I was I meant to pose it as a question. Mm -hmm. Have the rabbis through the ages? discuss this, this, the, this need for perfection in body, only in body to so, approach. So first of all, let's be clear. This text, uh, as we encounter it, is describing who can be uh, a priest performing certain functions, okay? Uh, and so we don't have that function anymore. Yes. I right. Know. So this is this applies to and, even though you are you are perfect in body. No, so this this, this doesn't apply right anymore. And you we don't have this function anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it it <laughs> offers up actually we encountered uh, within what we read one of the bases for the the uh, tension and debate between uh, the priestly class and what became known as the rabbinic class of people, um, which has to do with uh, when does one, we read, 
you shall you start start counting off a certain number of days, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it was a big debate between the priests and the early rabbis. Well, when do you start counting that? And the priests had one answer, and the rabbis had a completely different answer. And it, and it has to and it evolved into uh, the the when we begin when we observe uh, Shavuot and and what that's all about. But the so the priests and the uh, rabbis were in uh, deep uh, disagreement with one another. But what's fascinating is I was just uh, reading some Talmud th this morning, and it's fascinating is that a an argument and a discussion and a debate that was happening, let's say about the year 400 or 500 of the common era, which is you know, 500 years after the destruction of the temple, after uh, there is no more uh, priestly function uh, and, and priestly class, if you will. And yet the rabbis in the Talmud are still talking about them and arguing about- Oh, good. Right? <laughs> But so why, so to me, it's fascinating. What's fascinating is that they could have just said, hey, there's no more, there are no more priests in the year 450 CE. There, there's no temple. There's no, uh, and so let's not even talk about them. They're history. They're the, in the dustbin of history. Why even bother discussing uh, all their requirements and so forth? Why, does, why bother discussing who can, whether a priest can marry a widow, whether a priest can marry someone who's not a virgin? They discuss these things. Why do they do that? Why do they discuss something that has no relevance any, anymore? So that to me was fascinating. It has to do, I think, with the nature of the way to make change, radical change, is to still take the past with you rather than to have rather than just throw it into the garbage. So that to me was fascinating. So thank you very much for bringing that up, Margo. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me go to uh, Robert and then Mark. Well, so I love Margo's comment and I appreciated so much your comments. You know, if we were to take the concept and fast forward it to make it relevant for today, a priest is one who ministers to others. So all of us in this day have that, as I understand it, have that responsibility through social discourse, building community, making the world a better place. Body and form are outward, which I would liken to our activities, what we say, what we do. The spiritual is understood in the text. So when I bring that forward, then I look at that as my body and my form, my outward behavior, my speech, my caring, all of these should be as perfect as I can make them. And of course, our perfection is imperfection, striving towards perfection. So I loved your comment and yours as well, Rabbi. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. And Mark. Okay, so uh, I absolutely love this discussion of fractals. <clears throat> and I think actually the Pollock painting is a, is a wonderful uh, example of uh, fractal thinking. It's just so, uh, I mean, it's just, it, you look at it and, and it just, it, well, it really defies description. Um, so when I saw that definition on fractals, I immediately thought of the monad and the monad is, um, it, it was a term that became um, popularized uh, by Leibniz who happened to be, by the way, one of Spinoza's uh, rivals. And he's, he described the monad this way, that it is a unique, indestructible, dynamic, soul-like entity. They have no true causal relation with other monads, but they're all perfectly synchronized with each other by God in a pre-established harmony. The objects of the material world are simply appearances of collections of monads or fractals. I just found that that was an amazing uh, thought about the use of the fractal in, in this, and the painting to me typifies that beautifully. Wow, thank you so much, Mark. That's fascinating. Okay, and, and Richard? About fractals and monads. Mm -hmm. They're not, not kind of fenced there. They can see each other. They're 
put together by some other force. They don't relate. But I took a class as an undergraduate and we studied a lot about power. And the thing I came away with was that Pollock had said one time, he wanted to be the painting. Right. And I look at this and I just see in the white, I just see all this, all art is self-portrait. And I just see him dancing. And he, as you pointed out, he's a crazy man uh, and doesn't have really good boundaries. He's, he's caught up in the large self with a capital S and trying to join with that, be part of that, and erase the little ego self. It's very, very hard to do. That's kind of like treating thy neighbor as thyself. And he's joining the world with his actions. And uh, that's a fractal. We're all little fractals of this big thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Anna, did you want to say? Um, Marco, I want to say, uh, Esther Chayil, a woman of valor, grace is deceptive and beauty is vain. But it's for her fear of yod hey vav hey that a woman is to be praised. So we have a counterbalance. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it isn't about being beautiful. Right. And uh, let me, uh, Tom and Jackie, and then Catherine. Uh, um this with fractals and, and how that relates to Torah is interesting. Um, Anil Seth is a British uh, neuropsychologist and, and he, he says that basically we're living a life of hallucinations and best guesses. My best guess is that's Mark Thompson there. Oh, no, 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 it's Larry Thompson. I'm his twin brother, but my best guess is it's you. And my best guess is that um, behind Mike is a globe. I don't know, maybe it's something else, you know. And then, but then I look at this Jackson Pollock thing. I can't make it, I, you know, I want to organize things. I want it in paper. I want the Torah to spell it out for me. And um, I, I could sit and watch, I could look at this for probably a couple of hours. And it's just fascinating how I can't see the fractals, I can't. But it's it's just so fun to look at. It's it's wow, <laughs> what a crazy guy. Anyway, that's my that's my religious contribution. For yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. All right, and let me invite uh, Catherine. Yeah, looking at the painting and using the painting as a point of departure, um, it struck me that we're not really actually looking at convergence. We're looking at the possibility of convergence. Mm -hmm. And that possibility is given by <clears throat> looking into the layers and looking at the dynamic among the layers and how those layers interact. And, and in the same way, we're not given um, holiness in Torah. We're given the possibility of that. Mm -hmm. We're given some, some blueprint for a possibility and the, these parashas. I love that, Catherine. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank That's you. Wonderful. That's really, really is beautiful. Thank you, Catherine. And, and, and let me invite Robin. Um, well, when I was looking at this um, painting, it, it really appealed to me. And I've looked at Jackson Pollock paintings before. My brother-in-law is an artist and he, he, Jackson Pollock is his favorite artist. I'm not sure why, um, but in looking at it, what, what I saw as convergence was the fact that for however he created this, everything has converged onto this, onto this um, artwork that disparate, colors and paints and whatever are have converged in fact and maybe not in a way that we might normally think of as convergence as kind of two things become one whatever but it did seem to me that it, it was an act of convergence like creating that 
Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and 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 what you've all got me to thinking about uh, the word and Margo raised it. Uh, this notion about perfection. Um, there's a beautiful book called The Spirituality of Imperfection. And what we've been discussing with the whole book of Leviticus, we talked about how Leviticus can be seen as an interruption of this flow of the heroic narrative of from slavery to freedom, basically. And Leviticus interrupts that flow as if there's a recognition about, oh, to become free is not, doesn't merely proceed from being released from confinement. That to, to really be free requires development and growth and discipline and practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the book of Leviticus is in a sense, a recognition of our imperfections uh, and giving us some tools with which to then go back on the journey, uh, but that we carry these imperfections with us and we also carry with us the possibility uh, of achieving at least a, an experience of perfection. And, we, and Judaism builds that into the calendar. It builds that into the calendar by saying, six days of the week, you're gonna labor. A and, and on the seventh day, everything is okay. You have everything that you need. You don't need to labor. And if you practice that, if you practice that opportunity, then you can have an experience that we can call convergence. We can call in, it's called devikut, attachment. Uh, you can, and then you have a taste of it. And then you go back to the six days of the week, where once again, you're going to encounter people that cut you off on the freeway. You're going to encounter people that annoy you at work. You're going to encounter your, your own short tempers. You're going to encounter uh, all these things that, that uh, make for your imperfection, but it is the imperfection, if you will, uh, that, uh, that is just a part of life and to, to try too hard to be perfect becomes another form of stress in one's life. And one doesn't need to try it because it's a gift. Shabbat is a gift. Um, so I, I, I want to kind of uh, one, thank everyone for your profound uh, participation and, and contributions and to say that what we've been learning uh, in this week's Torah portion, I believe, is that we have been given these moments of accessing something that makes us feel loved, cared for, attended to, part of something much bigger than ourselves. Uh, and it is uh, an intimacy uh, that causes us uh, to be grateful uh, and, and to feel uh, a deep and profound love. And I want to thank everyone for, for contributing to that sense of love and compassion and intimacy in our gatherings. God bless you all. I thank look you forward so to much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.